Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. Today we're very excited to have our guests, Dr. C. Matt Corum, Dr. Joe Roycey, and Duncan Lutz, and today they'll, they'll be giving a presentation discussing recent research looking to advance wildland fire, smoke, and emissions modeling. Now on with our presentation. Dr. C. Mac Corum is a professor of remote sensing and image processing. He holds a joint faculty appointment at UC Berkeley and North Carolina State University. He's the author of over 200 publications and has served as the principal investigator for well over 60 major research projects focused on remote sensing, image processing, and geospatial information technology. He serves as the PI for the development of new geospatial tools for wildland fire management and risk reduction, a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional research project at UC Berkeley. Dr. Joe Roycey is a professor of forestry and operations research at the North Carolina State University. He performs, performs research on all operational problems associated with forest management, including mechanical fuel treatments, harvest logistics, prescribed fire, and associated planning questions. He teaches cor courses in forest management, forest operations, and fire science. And he's part of the Southern Fire Exchange program. Finally, last but not least, Duncan Lutz is a fire ecologist at the U.S. Forest Service Missoula Fire Science Laboratory. He received a B.S. in forest management and an M.S. in forestry from the University of Montana. Duncan's background is in fuels, and he's been involved in the development of the first order fire effects model and the fire and fuels extension to the forest vegetation simulator, FireMon, fuel loading models, the FEET FireMon integrated, and fuel cow. So welcome to each of you, and let's go ahead and change it so you all can start your presentations today. Well, good morning or afternoon for um, some of you in the East. I'm Joe Roycey, and I'm going to start off the uh, presentation about the advancements we've made in smoke and mission models util utilizing geospatial and remote sensing data for wildland fire management and risk reduction. Um, CMAC and Duncan have already been introduced by David very nicely. And I just want to quickly go down to what we're going to cover today. First of all, we're going to look at the, the current situation with uh, smoke emission models. Then we're going to go into the first order fire effects model. Uh, Duncan Lutz will give that presentation. Then we'll go into the emission estimation system, which is uh, EES. Um, I try to use, we try to use the full name in this presentation, but sometimes we might slip into using acronyms. I apologize for that at the start. And the data sources, then the final thing we're going to cover, the data sources we use to improve the accuracy of FOFAM and the EES model. So the current situation. Okay, first of all, and I'm sure many of you are already aware, that the uh, <clears throat> that both of the federal and state agencies all recognize the need for better estimates of emissions from prescribed and other wildland fires, and a unified approach to managing lands for pres prescribed and wildfire. Agencies use both FOFM and EES models, so the first order fire effects model and the emission estimation system models to simulate fuel emissions from wildland fires. Then the, the general model outputs include particulate matter at 10 microns in size, particulate matter at 2.5 microns in size, carbon monoxide, methane, NOx, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide. Estimates of burn severity and fuel moisture content currently limit the accuracies of these models, and that's our major improvement right now. And also, at the very bottom of the page, hopefully you can see it, I, I want to just uh, call out some of the people at the University of California uh, NASA project who has made many of these improvements. 
and that's led by CMI Karam. Uh, but also Greg Bigging is on the project, Peng Gong, Matthew Potts, Jayatha Ibrahima, and Yan Li Chen. So even though they're not presenting, their 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 spirit is here with us. Okay. <clears throat> So our accomplishments today, just to summarize it, we've mapped burn severity from ETM. We've developed procedures and mapped burn severity from UAV SAR to use as an input to smoke emission models. And then we tested the sensitivity of 1,000 hour fuel moisture conditions on gas emissions. Um, so these are just a general summary of what we're, we'll speak to uh, in a little bit. At this point, I wanted to hand off to Duncan Lutz in uh, Missoula to go over the first order fire effects model. All right, thanks, Joe. So um, this is just going to be a pretty brief presentation of what Fulfam is and, and uh, what the, the kind of outputs that come out of Fulfam. And, and then uh, Joe and CMAC will talk more about how those outputs are incorporated into their project. But FOFM is a, it's a computer system to calculate first order fire effects, which is what FOFM stands for, first order fire effects model. Um, and those are calculated from, from some pretty basic inputs. It's not real complex to use. Uh, first order fire effects that are the immediate consequences of fire. So for instance, the immediate uh, emissions that come off of uh, prescribed fire, or wildland fire, but we don't do the secondary effects, which might be how those compounds are changing in the atmosphere. So it's just the first order fire effects that both of them is modeling. It is a Windows desktop application and it has a graphical user interface. It's pretty straightforward and easy to use. Uh, so you can do one plot at a time. But then it also has a batch mode. So if you have a number of plots, such like in the project you're hearing about today, you can do lots of uh, simulations uh, in a short period of time. It includes a me mechanistic model for simulating witty fuel consumption. We have empirical equations for estimating the consumption of uh, the other components like the litter and the duff and vegetation. And then it has an extensive set of default fuel inputs. So if basically if you know your forest type or your range type, then the default uh, fuel inputs are there and available for you to use so you can do some simulation. We always encourage people to actually be collecting their own data rather than using the defaults. But if you don't have any real field data, uh, the defaults are a good place to start. Fulfum predicts four basic things: the fuel consumption, which we'll talk more a little bit uh, a little bit later. But that's uh, is modeled in the burn-up model, which is the me mechanistic model, uh, and it produces smoke production estimates based on how much fuel is consumed. And then we, because burnup computes intensity, we can calculate how much intensity is going down into the soil versus up. And we incorporate that with duff depth and whether or not the duff is burning to get some estimate of soil heating. And then tree mortality, which is based on crown scorch and the DBH of the tree. So those are the four basic things that Fulfram predicts. Most of what I'm going to talk about, well, actually, the rest of what I'm going to talk about here is the emissions because that's the most important for today's presentation. So Fulfram predicts the fuel consumption rate because it's because burnup is running in the background. It's that mechanistic model. Every 60 seconds of simulated burning time, we know how much fuel is consumed and then how much emission production there is, um, what the fire intensity was over the interval um, during that time. Burnup also simulates, or I'm sorry, Fulfum simulates the proportion of flaming and smoldering combustion, and that's based on the intensity of the fire. So we know from burnup the intensity of the different parts of the fuel complex that are burning, and so we can at the same time simulate how much flaming and smoldering combustion there is. And then we use uh, combustion efficiency and em emissions factors that vary with the fuels and the moisture in order to produce the emissions estimates that come out of Fulfum. And in today's presentation, these fuels and moisture uh, are the biggest inputs that we're looking to improve on in this, in this current project. 
Wolfram produces estimates of the PM 2.10 or sorry, PM10, PM2.5, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and so forth. This pretty standard things that we like to keep track of. As I said before, the, the emissions are uh, estimated by multiplying the fuel consumption by the emissions factors. Flaming and smoldering combustion can occur at the same time in the model, and so they occur in relative amounts depending on the fuel moisture and the fuel particle size and the fire intensity. And emissions production is estimated in those 60 second time intervals from ignition until the combustion ceases. So we have the whole, at any particular point in time, we have the whole uh, picture of how much emission was, how many emissions were produced over that time period. We have lots of full from users. I'm not going to go through them all, but basically most of the, the federal land management agencies use them. And then we have uh, these other agencies like Nature Conservancy um, and the California Air Resources Board in particular, because they're involved in today's presentation, um, use the model. And if you're interested for more information about FOFM, you can go to the Fire Lab website, the science applications, and you can download the FOFM application, the FOFM user guide. And then if you have any other questions, you can just give me a call. Uh, my information's on the FireLab website. So I think that that's all I have about uh, Fulfum. Oh, other than this slide, I'll just point out that this is kind of a complex slide that shows the, the flow chart of how things um, are incorporated in the ESS. And the information that's on the right side is the Fulfum model. And the information that's on the, the left side is ESS. So I'll let uh, CMAC take it over from here. Okay, thanks, Duncan. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, my name is CMAC Coram, and um, thank you, David, for your very nice uh, introduction. And I will be talking about some of the model input, output, and the remote sensing components associated with it. So as Duncan mentioned, the right side of this slide, this area, basically that is how FOFM is structured and is working all the way from the inputs to the emission report that produces. Now, FOFM is primarily a point-based model. Now, what we have done at Berkeley, we have developed a new model from a couple of years ago. It's, by the way, that's not ESS, that is EES, Emission Estimation System. And some people know, know about uh, Berkeley Emission Estimation System. and. Um, what we have taken, we have taken the FOFM model and we have produced some of the inputs to FOFM model in geospatial context, meaning that we have prepared the spatial distribution of input parameters. So therefore, we can get the spatial distribution of some of the output products. And, and it is beyond the scope of this webinar to go through the details of the models. But for those of you who are interested, you are welcome to contact me. May just call at berkeley.edu and I can provide you the information or point you in the right direction. The emission estimation system model, primarily these are the major input components to the model. One is the fire perimeter, which is a polygon-based input. The other one is vegetation cover, which in California is based on CalVeg, cross worked with the SAF and SRM, Society of American Forest Strength and Range Management, and uh, fire characteristics classification system. And then the, with respect to the fuel moisture, which is one of the major inputs, it is based on four discrete fuel conditions. Very dry, dry, moderate, and wet. And then, so I will talk more about it as we go into the presentation 
and some of the things that we're doing to change that for more accurate uh, estimation and spatial distribution estimation of some of the output product. And also takes in some non-spatial data. And then so the fuel adjustment that comes from a lookup table and then goes into the, into the model. The, just like, just like FOFOM, EES produces these output products that, that both Joe and Duncan went through it, so I won't repeat that. You should add, though, it has the EES also provides the total mass of gas emissions for a specific area. Right. So that's an addition. Yes, that's in addition, and that's the power of the geospatial data input. And then the major users of EES at this point, EES was developed at the request of California Air Resources Board on the Berkeley campus and is being utilized by California Air Resources Board routinely on day-to-day -day basis for their operation. So any improvements that we can, we can make to EES, they are happy and they are participating and they are helping us out and they are, they are going to be using it. In addition to that, if we make the improvement to the EES and make it more comprehensive model and then the agencies that the they are currently utilizing the FOFA model, will also utilize the EES model. Think about it this way. EES is the spatial distribution model of FOFA, with some improvement that we are planning to do to it. What is EES used for? To setting acceptable upper and lower fuel moisture conditions for issuing the control bear permits. For the, this is both for urban areas, uh, shoplands, and forested areas. This is the California Air Resources Board in combination with some of the, their counterparts in the Southern California. They are in charge of the entire state's uh, control burn uh, activities. Well, they also also determining that how many acres to be burned without exceeding the particular matter. Uh, particular emission limits. They, they also use it for assessing the atmospheric impact uh, of wildfire, both on urban areas as well as ecosystem level. They are improve, using it for improving the baseline estimates for greenhouse gas estimation. California Resources Board is commissioned for a, uh, a mandate that state has for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2020 to the level of 2006. So they are looking at the outputs of these models to see how well they're doing and whether they're moving in the right direction and correcting the course of actions as they go along. It will also can help in increasing the stock, carbon stock, which leads into reducing the fire risk. And it also using it for comparing the expected outcome of different alternative management interventions. How are we improving? On the left, the current input, one, two, three, four. On the right, we are the improved inputs to the model. Right now, the fire per perimeter is based on the depicting polygon. We are using the remote sensing based burn severity map that I will talk about it, how we're coming up with that. Uh, and number two, vegetation cover. Right now, it's Calvish crosswalked with different um, uh, class image, uh, land use land cover classification systems. Now, we're, we'll be using the land fire fuel data with remote sensing based land use land cover maps. One of the things that I like to think that we're doing quite well in is preparing land use land cover maps based on satellite and airborne remote sensing data. In terms of the fuel moisture, right now there are only four categories. I will give you more detail in the following slides. We're trying to see that 
if we can break it to into more than four categories or better yet we can make it a continuous value non-spatial data right now is just a, a fuel adjustment factor now what we're trying to do we're trying to come up utilizing landsat 8 data and modus for its follow up beers which is currently up and operating for the routine use, utilization of it landsat 8 as you well know it's a uh, 30 meter resolution and modus is 250 meter resolution views which is going to be replacing modus is 375 meter resolution so for a, for a much larger area uh, then these are our test sites that we're testing and developing procedures right now we are in the ponderosa fire site and also blodgett forest and then we will be adding big sur and Mayaka River State Park in, in our next phase of the studies if we're successful in securing the NASA funds for that with the decision for it should be coming up soon. The two sites that are currently be using one is the Ponderosa site. It's roughly about 60,000 acres of it burned and this is land holding of the Sierra Pacific Industries, which is a major operation in Northern California. And then I believe they have about 2 million acres of land holding all the way from the California to Pacific Northwest to uh, Idaho, Montana, and some part of British Columbia. And then they have a very major operation. And then also we're using the Blodgett Forest Research Station data which belongs to UC Berkeley, that's our, under our own control with the staff and facilities and everything that what they do, they, um, they have prescribed burning and they, they monitor it, you know, every few years they have, they have, they burn part of the, part of the experimental station and then they do all kinds of uh, measurements. Both of these sites, they have extensive aerial, satellite coverage, archival and current as well as very extensive uh, inventory data so that's one of the things that we like about it and this slide and the following two slides uh, i took that in the field when we were doing the field measurements this is about roughly a couple of months after a major fire went through the ponderosa uh, site this is what we label it as not burned or unburned this is partially burned, as you will note, if you're looking from satellite data, so, you know, depending on how much is burned, still the spectral signature of uh, what you see, uh, it's still, there's a lot of green there. So there is a lot of uh, uh, infrared reflection in there that satellite detects and maps it, so it makes it um, somewhat difficult to map the burned areas and somewhat easy to if you can classify it into degree of burns which we'll talk about it and then also this slide which is totally burned so all these three slides were taken in the same day on the same site i mean walking up and down up and down the forest in terms of data sources what are we using we're using landsat 8 and landsat etm enhanced schematic mapper data which uh, Landsat 8 is the new one that was launched a few months ago and then it has some additional bands to Landsat uh, ETM data that provides us with a better handle on vegetation classification as well as environmental assessment of what's out there then we're also using UAV SAR which is um, an inhabited aerial vehicle uh, they used to call that unman unmanned aerial vehicle but NASA changed the, the thing to say uninhabited <laughs> and then so the SAR stands for synthetic aperture radar which basically is radar data but different look angles to give you higher resolution then we are using ABRES which is advanced visible and infrared imaging spectrometer that's a hyperspectral imager and flown over either ER2 as 50,000 feet to 65,000 feet or can be flown over to another at a lower altitude and then the next gen of the of address is planning to 
fly at a much lower altitude. It provides spectral data in 224 bands, uh, which makes it very difficult to, uh, to analyze. And then also the, uh, it gives you a lot of detail with respect to the different type and different degrees of burning vegetation, and also gives you information on the soil moisture, dead fuel moisture. So we are in the midst of trying to analyze that. So uh, we do not have a conclusive results, but we're getting there. We are also using MODIS and VIRS. As I mentioned, uh, the spatial resolution is not for good for small uh, fires, but for large areas, uh, it works fine because both VIRS and MODIS and Landsat data are free of charge and available to everybody. And UAVSAR and ABRAS data has to be flown from JPL or controlled by a Jet Propulsion Laboratory out of, uh, out of Pasadena in California. And they're very expensive to operate, but the data that comes from them can help us calibrate and get a better handle on utilizing the routinely and free of charge available satellite data for the continuous and sustained utilization by the end user uh, community. CMAC, can I ask you a question? Sure. Sure. Is uh, UA, V, SARS, and Avaris, are they uh, flown by fixed wing aircraft or satellite? Yes. Yeah, no, fixed wing aircraft. Okay. They, 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 they flown either ER 2, which was the U 2 aircraft, modified. There are two of them that NASA owns. One is operated out of uh, Sunnyvale, California, out of Moffett Field. The other one is of Hampton, Virginia, in Langley, and they control that. And then Abras also the same the same way. They're, that's one and the other one they fly on, um, on to another. That's a really good question because one of the things that NASA is pushing for now, Rob Green out of NASA JPL is trying to push to get the Abras data on, on a satellite. And uh, that's not an easy undertaking. But UAV SAR data, there are SAR data that is collected by satellite by Canadian radar sat by ERS out of the European Space Agencies and by the, some of the archival data from the shuttle missions and also the International Space Station uh, is going to have some of the data uh, there. So then the next one is the, is the um, SPI, which stands for Sierra Pacific Industries and then uh, uh, um, color infrared imagery, that's the imagery that they collect using their own aircraft and their own facilities and was available to us. That's a one foot resolution data. And the, also the high resolution, the National Agricultural Inventory Program, Imaging Program, uh, which is one meter resolution data. And you can see that we have a variety of uh, different resolution of spectral data and spatial data. We're trying to see that what are some of the optimal sensors and how they can be utilized by the wildland fire community in the future. We also couple that with a lot of field data that we did uh, measure in our sites ourselves. We did measure the dead fuel based on the brown method, the one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour fuel, and then also from the soils, from the duff and litter, moisture and from the light foliage uh, from the tree and couple that with the canopy factors and inventory data. Uh, Sierra Pacific Industries, they even downed some of the trees for us to measure the fuel moisture on top of the canopy, top of the trees as it's seen by aircraft or satellite. Okay, this is... That's me on the left and Glenn from Sierra Pacific Industries on the right That's doing true. some field measurements. So you actually do some physical work. I actually <laughs> did some work, yes. But in, in the field, not just on the computer. And then, so for mapping the burn severity, we did three approaches. We calculated normalized burn ratio, a classic approach by Landsat and has thematic mapper imager. Uh, and uh, also we developed our own procedure for processing the UAV SAR data for getting the burn severity, which is, was not an easy task. 
And also we did some analysis of adverse data that we'll talk about. All of them, we coupled the field data and remote sensing data together. In the normalized middle ratio, all of you know this, but anyway, so we I, use I the... I think everybody knows this. Yeah. Okay. All right. With the band 4, which is the infrared on the Landsat TM data, one of the infrared, the first short wave infrared band minus band 7, which is the polar light infrared band divided by band 4 uh, plus band 7. And then, so then we did, we estimated the NBR, which is normalized burn ratio, for pre-fire of the same area and post-fire. And we uh, gave us DNBR, which with some indicing factor translates into the, uh, the uh, burn severity. And here there are some threshold uh, established to to convert the DNBR data into the uh, burn severity. And then so there are basically some brackets that you convert into unburned, uh, low, moderate, moderate, high, and high. So that's... Once we've done all of those song and dance, that's what we come up with. So we map the same area which was burned into five categories. And when remember that at the beginning I said that the fire perimeter is depicted and then put as an input. So as an input, all of this area is inputted as area went through fire, burn, burned area. But in here, as I showed you in some of my slides, there are some areas that they are not burned, some areas that they are partially burned, and some areas that totally burn. So we feel like the spatial distribution of these parameters will give uh, the user a better handle on that. Could you give a, go back to that? Could you give an explanation of what we're seeing there as far as the, the little dots all over the... These? Yes. Oh, these are the different pockets that they were clear cut. Okay. And then that, and then they were some of these clear cut areas, as you see, they were not burned, and some of them uh, were just burned land that we eliminated that, and, and so forth. So, are they also? Is there prescribed fires in there? No prescribed that? fire in this side, but we have prescribed fire on the other side. Okay. Okay. This is a procedure that we developed. Let me see how, how am I doing time-wise. I'm not doing good time-wise. So UAV SAR-based data. So I won't go through the de details. We get the raw data from here. We go through some sort of a terrain correction, which is a difficult process. We go through radiometric correction. We segment the images. We run it through the unsupervised classification. And then at the beginning, we, uh, we take the the burn, barren land and developed land out of it because the signatures are very similar to totally burned areas. And then uh, we go through the classification. We, uh, we, we come up and label the classified data, run it through a filter here, and then we come up with the, uh, with the far left lower, which is the burn severity map. That is based on the UAB SAR data, synthetic aperture radar. And to my knowledge, I have not seen very many people doing this. So basically, we take the data, raw data, which is on the right side, and convert it to the left side data, which is the burn severity data. And the reason that the bottom part is a straight line, because that's where the aircraft started imaging. And for those of you who are interested in the procedure that we used, it is published by the European Space Agency for um, polarimetric SAR data. And you can go to this, and then you can, and they are very helpful in, in helping you implement the, the software. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the fuel moisture content, which is, which is a, a, a real which is a very major input and a real issue. Now, when you look at that, if you graph the fuel moisture on the lower side of the graphs against 
the model output of the emissions. For the smoldering data, we get this. For the total area, we get this. And notice that at 10% fuel moisture content, we get a drastic decrease in terms of the um, in terms of the emission, and that creates a problem because this is all of this area that's being used is based on very dry, dry, moderate, and wet, which is one to ten percent, eleven to fifteen, sixteen to thirty, and thirty to one hundred. So the procedure that we're developing is to make this more than four categories, or better yet, if we can do it, make it into a continuous function, which will improve the accuracy of our output product. Example, this is currently what fuel moisture content is used in these models. If you look at um, July, August, September, you see the entire state of California, with the exception of some coastal fringes, it's all in red. That means that very dry. It probably is a lot of it very dry, but not to this extent. And then, so, then when that goes into the model, it, it impacts the accuracy of the output products. What we're doing, we're trying to come up with what you see on the right side, and then, and then, which is taking it into a continuous, so that way, and by the way, the colors for both of these are pretty much the same. And then, as you can see, the variations and the gradients are different uh, areas, are quite different. So, which is more representative of the real world when you go into mapping these things. So, that is we feel like that would make a major improvement into the model output. In terms of the long-term decision, I'm going to let Joe talk to you about it because he knows what he's talking about. Oh, thank you. Um, so the, the bottom line is, is that these models are being used for decision-making um, really all over the country if you look at FOFEM. And for the EES model, that is being used extensively in California, but it's basically it's a GIS modeling framework that uses FOFAM inside of it. And it incorporates the remote sensing data. Um, what we're trying to get is better data input in, into the uh, estimations. Now, in the East, I know that we are limited many times by the amount of emissions going into the atmosphere. And the estimates we use are, are, are pretty, pretty simple um, multiplication factors about estimate of uh, tons of fuel loading and the amount, the expected amount of uh, um, or fire severity, it's the expected amount of, of burning. So we get better, we get better upper and lower fuel moisture estimates for setting control burns. So that, that's a big thing. So it's widening, hopefully widening the window for prescribed fire. We get better estimates of the number of acres burned on a given day without exceeding particulate emissions. So now there's the constraint of particulate emissions, and I know many of us already deal with that. Um, so we get better estimates on how, many, how much is going up each day and better comparisons of overall assessments of expected outcomes of alternative management and interventions. Also, of course, global warming, or um, as people call it now, is climate change variation solutions. Um, but in California, you have the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. You want to explain that a little yeah, bit? Which, which basically means that the, the California Air Resources has been commissioned to, in terms of controlling the uh, uh, the prescribed burns and uh, some other alternative uh, management interventions that they are doing, and then to to make sure that in the year 2020, 2020, the the greenhouse gas uh, emissions are 
not exceeding what has been reported and measured and documented in 2006. And that's, that's what one of the things that, that determines the decision whether where to burn, how many acres to burn, and what time to burn, and then and, and the methods associated with it, or not burn and go to alternative uh, management strategies and so forth. Uh, Klaus Scott, which runs that program out of the California Resources Board, is very much in tune with that. So if any one of you would like to see that um, how it's done and so forth, my suggestion would be that uh, email Klaus Scott at carb.gov and then or look him up on the internet and you can get his coordinates. <laughs> okay, next. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for listening. Now we're open for questions. All right. Well, thank you, right. guys. Thank uh, you, guys. Uh, <laughs> Whoa, it looks like we've got well, the feedback. Out the the feedback again. <laughs> Once again, for Once y'all that are out there, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who joined us during the presentation today? I'm going to mute some guys just real quick. Just real quick. There, I think we were getting some feedback. Uh, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the outreach coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. And our guest today for our webinar uh, was Sam Coram, Joe Roycey, and Duncan Lutz. At this point, we have plenty of time left in our hour uh, for questions from the audience. So I'm sure there are questions out there. So please go ahead and type those in uh, to the chat screen in the lower right-hand corner of the window, and we will work to, uh, to address those now. Let's see, we give folks a minute to type thing, any questions in there. Mm -hmm. So while we wait, I had a question. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was already mentioned or not. Maybe you could clarify a little bit. In terms of the output from the EES, um, are you constrained or is it going to be limited to the uh, spatial scale of the uh, input imagery? Or is everything got, or are all your outputs going to be at a 30 meter Landsat resolution? Good question. Good question. All of the outputs would be in the resolution that we put in in terms of our input and the, the type of the output is fixed because the model produces those. And that's fixed at 30 meters? Well, 30 meter is Landsat data that we base it on. It depends on what time they say like if you've got a small area that you want to really go into details and you want to use the satellite data and, or you want to use a higher resolution data as input. For example, if you want to use QuickBird, which comes at uh, a multi-spectral of 2.44 meters, then you can get your output product to some of them limited to that. It all depends on the resol spatial resolution of the input parameters. Some of the satellite, most of the satellite data does provide the spectral resolution along the line of what is required. So, but some of the high resolution satellite data, which currently in the adapter, such as QuakeBird, WorldView 2, and uh, GOI 1, which uh, Google Earth is using, you know, which uh, 1.4 meter data. So, those type of things are limited to your input resolution. Did I answer the question? Yes, yes, that helps. So I'm just thinking in terms of um, the application to burners at, at different size or different scales on the ground. So um, our outputs, as you as you just answered, our outputs are really limited by our inputs. Um, and so I'm thinking in terms of the end users of this will will definitely could be people who are burning on the thousands of acres of scale. Uh, but do you see this as being applicable to folks that are burning on the hundreds of acres or, or smaller? Uh, uh, that's an excellent question. That's a question that we've been dealing with because we've got in the, in the, in the Blodgett Forest, we've got a small area. The entire Blodgett Forest area is 4,000 acres. 
and it's divided into compartments and and we we burn it in in a much small parcels and then so for that you know we're looking at the higher resolution satellite data and then for the larger areas we're looking at the procedure that that we're we're, we're developing and CARB is using California Resources Board now in terms of using it in a smaller scale spatially then perhaps will require some modification to come up with an accurate uh, estimation of the output product so those type of modification perhaps needs to be done but in a but as a as in general the model outputs are restricted to the model inputs in terms of the spatial and spectral resolution spectral resolution does not um, uh, provide a major problem because a lot of satellite data in the bands that we're using the infrared uh, bands and so forth they're okay spatial mm -hmm. resolution again if we're using the same bands on a much lower scale you know we can provide the input parameters at lower scale but we might have to do some some um, um, some further work in terms of the output product it will produce an output product at that scale but whether it is to the level of accuracy which is acceptable and desired needs to be needs to be experimented and adjusted perhaps or some caveats built in the model for it so cma can i ask more on that question sure so the what you're taking is a, a gis landscape uh, polygons and mm -hmm. for each of those you're going to have a, um, a single characteristic about fuel moisture for instance yes and so that that characteristic of fuel moisture depends upon the satellite data that has what the satellites have observed on that on that polygon so coupled with the National Weather Service data on daily basis right yeah so so you're going to get one number for the moisture content for that polygon and so maybe the neighboring polygons might have a different uh, pixel on the satellite image and they'd have another number and so what, what you're saying is is that it limits your accuracy of your results because the if the polygons are too small it might not be covering the all you're having is one polygon for that one particular or one one pixel for that yeah. particular polygon. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a good way of looking at it. Say like if you're using modus data, so your resolution is 250 meters. Okay, for a box of 250 meters by 250 meters, you get one signal, you get one number. Or if you're using the Landsat TM data, for every box of 30 meter by 30 meter, you get one data. So it all depends on which, where, and which one you're planning to use. The procedure which is being developed is to be able to use the TM as well as MODIS. Now we're working on the higher resolution satellite data. There's another question being asked here. Which one? I see a, a couple yes. other questions. Jim Brenner says, are AVHR and NDVI used in the fuel moisture calculations? NDHRR is a one kilometer resolution data and NDVI based on that is it is is utilized in can be utilized for fuel load and vegetation mapping at that level one kilometer by one kilometer for the fuel moisture calculation we are not using it at this point and now if someone would be interested to utilize it on a large scale then it is possible to put some adjustment factors and into the calculations to be able to utilize it but without without uh, exp applying it and testing it and validating the model uh, the answer at this point is no Well, good. And I have a question for Duncan. Duncan, are you still listening? Still here. Okay. So, in the, 
in FOFAM is the fuel moisture calculation for burn severity, is that a continuous function or is that a, a stepwise function? Well, the, the fuel moisture that, that's used in FOFAM is selected by the user. And so I'm not sure um, what, what you mean for the relationship to fire severity. I'm not sure what you mean. So I was thinking within the FOFAM model, so the user uh, picks whatever the fuel moisture is or assigns it. Then it goes into right. the model. Right. Is that an equation or is that like a lookup table? It's a lookup table. OK. OK, do we have any other questions from the audience or, or do you all have any more comments? All right, and just to, to clarify, I guess you're awaiting uh, notification of your funding of, uh, application to expand this to Mayaka and to look more towards the east. Is that correct? Yes, and I wanted to also respond to, to Jim's question with respect to Florida. If we, if we get our second phase of funding, then we will really look into all kinds of uh, uh, satellite data that are routinely available, such as AVHRR, to see if there are any type of uh, processing or pre-processing or front-end processing that can be done to the AVHRR to make it uh, usable for a version of this type of models. So it would be really nice to uh, to hear from you, Jim, and then if we get funded to, to see if we can uh, collaborate uh, along those lines if uh, you have an interest. That sounds very good. All right, let's, let me switch here, and um, in case Jim doesn't have contact information, he should see it here on the screen in just a minute. Well, maybe you guys have the opportunity to, to work together in the future. Oh, oh, Berkeley is spelled wrong. It's B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y. <laughs> Good catch. He's in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, we'll leave it at that one then. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys uh, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciated all the effort that went into your presentation, and thanks to everyone who uh, joined us on the, the webinar. Um, seeing as how it seems like we're about done with uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if, for those who joined us, we do ask that you please take a couple of minutes and click on that link right there in the middle of the screen and uh, fill out a very short uh, questionnaire and let us know how we can tailor, tailor our future webinars to meet your fire science needs. Uh, so let us know what you thought of the webinar today and let us know uh, what kind of things you'd like to see in the future. As we said earlier, today's webinar uh, was recorded, and uh, we'll have that up on our YouTube page in about a week or so. Uh, so if, if you didn't catch the beginning or you want to uh, share it with others, uh, it, it'll be archived there uh, in perpetuity. Uh, so thanks, everybody, who joined us. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Cymac, Joe, and Duncan. And we appreciate all the work that went into your presentations today. Thank you, you David, for the opportunity. We enjoyed it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.